Welcome to the second part of my venture into the enormous world of Oblivion's testing content. I'd advise you to watch the first part for the general rules and the previously covered worlds as today I'm gonna start right where I left off previously with a handful of testing worlds that didn't make it into the last episode, before moving on to the interior testing cells. And yeah, let's get right into that testing stuff. So the first one up to bat this time is MQ15 Test World 3. And say it with me now, this world is completely empty. But what was its purpose? Well, MQ15 is the internal name for the main quest, Paradise, and that's basically your answer. This was likely a general layout test for Paradise, and the third iteration of it to boot, as the previous two worlds have been deleted from the files. Nice to see the effort, even though Paradise doesn't really amount to much in the final game. The four remaining test worlds are all Shivering Isles related. This may devalue my statement in the previous episode about the DLC not having general test worlds, but I mean, the base game clearly has a majority, right? SE Test Island is a test version of the island that appears in the middle of Nibbon Bay where you would normally enter the Isles. Although it appears that this test version is visually identical to the version encountered in the final game, only lacking some small decorative polish, and of course the NPCs. SE Test Cylarn is, like you guessed it, an early rudimentary version of Cylarn, although in this case the test cell lacks a lot more than just some basic visual polish. Besides that, there isn't anything to talk about, just a basic ruin layout. And then there's Test SE Grant, and just like some stuff in the last episode, the Grant mentioned here is Grant Struthers of the World Art Team. This world only contains two worthwhile cells, the first being Test Mania House, its a house model, like those typically found in Mania. Then there's also SE Test Gate Room, this name refers to the room you find yourself in after entering through the gate for the very first time. It has some basic mushroom plants, as well as a table and chairs, a candlestick and a circular rug. Basically, a rudimentary version of the aforementioned starting room, although it's missing the creepy shiogora themed metronome. All the other pieces stayed intact though. And finally, there's the most nondescript world of the bunch, simply called SE Test. Consisting of 49 cells, I don't exactly know what this world was used for. The majority of the cells are either empty or filled with flora to decorate the place. The only two named cells are called Test Mania and Test Dementia. Once again, their names tell me just about nothing. Test Mania is mostly filled with ingredients added by the DLC, as well as some clutter and a copy of Taedon's painting. Test Dementia is filled with some more clutter, as well as weapons and quest items. But why exactly this world was created, I simply can't say. And this finally marks all testing worlds concluded. Looking back, I could have put them in the previous episode, but I had assumed that these worlds would have been more in-depth, and that video is already long enough as it is. But now we're kinda moving on to the interior test cells. Why kinda? Well, because I want to focus on a select number of interior test cells first, before I move into the complete chaos territory. So, without further ado, let's head to the testing hall. This test cell isn't really a test cell at all. Rather, it's a hub location connecting many different test cells for easy access. With only a handful of exceptions, all the doors present here bring the player to a warehouse cell. I think I touched upon what warehouse cells are in the previous episode, but just for reference, warehouse cells in Elder Scrolls games are hidden cells from which the developer copies and pastes assets to place them into the playable world. This makes the world building process easier for developers, but also has the side effect of making locations feel samey. Of course, some warehouse cells you will see here today are also for general testing purposes, but usually a warehouse cell just serves as a place to keep stuff. Okay, with the explanation out of the way, what exactly does this testing hall hold in store for us? Well, we're basically put in a square room where each wall is lined with 10 doors. There's also another small square in the middle of the room, where each side is lined with 2 doors. In total, there are 48 different doors present. Some doors also have a red lighting effect. Others have a blue effect, and there are also ones with a green effect. As far as I'm aware, these lights don't really have a function. They just seem to indicate which doors lead somewhere and which don't. For example, the wall with blue lights only has doors that lead somewhere marked by said lights, with the exception of the very rightmost door. The square in the middle of the room only has connected doors marked by green lights, and the red lights just seem to be placed at random. Oh, and when I say doors that lead somewhere, I do mean that in a literal sense, as only half of the doors are actually connected to other cells. Yeah, of the 48 doors in this cell, only 24 of them actually have a purpose. Maybe they had linked more cells at one point, but those got removed and some didn't? That seems unlikely, but there are far more warehouse cells than the ones linked here. So that's kinda weird. But in order to discover the full weirdness of this cell, there's nothing else left to do but to head inside. If we head straight after spawning in, starting from the left, our first door leads to the upper class clutter warehouse. As expected, this room holds all kinds of generic clutter to decorate upper class houses with. This ranges from planters to beds to tapestries and rugs. 
But besides these items, nothing else of interest is located here. I should also note that under normal circumstances, this is one of those cells that's just pitch black. However, this can be remedied with a single console command. But this will result in the game's lighting as a whole looking a bit, well, off. So if you were thinking about that, that's why. The next door brings us to the middle class clutter warehouse. This cell is more of the same, but with middle class decorations. You don't really need another description of the items found here, right? Speaking about only the descriptions, the next door leads to the lower class clutter warehouse. This cell is remarkably smaller than the other two, but I guess that's also pretty self-explanatory. Then next up is the armor warehouse. In here we can find tables decorated with all the generic armor types found in the game, as well as unique items such as some quest rewards, etc. With the Shivering Isles DLC, some of that armor is also present here. Madness armor, Ember armor, as well as test variants of Dark Seducer, Golden Saint and Knight of Order armor. You might have seen this room previously in my video on leather armor. It's a nice novelty, but that's about it. Of course, this room would get followed up by the clothing warehouse. The same principles apply here. You've got all the basic clothes from the base game, some unique variants, as well as Shivering Isles clothes with that DLC installed. Although, these aren't test variants, they're the same as those encountered in the final game. Next is the weapons warehouse. Can you guess what this cell contains? I guess the one noteworthy thing here is that for some reason there's also an instance of test staff present here. And then there's the miscellaneous clutter warehouse. And yup, that sure is a room filled with miscellaneous clutter alright. This cell isn't altered with the Shivering Isles installed, should you be interested in those kind of changes. The cell does have one surprise in store for you though, and that's the fact that it isn't correctly linked back to the testing hall, leaving you stuck here. Moving on to something that isn't just an item dump, there's the lighting warehouse. Just an overall dark cell filled with all kinds of light sources to test how they looked. We've got wall sconces, candles, candelabras, chandeliers and overall just generic sources lighting effects. Pretty cool to see them in action like this. Talking about cool arrangements, here's book warehouse. This place basically holds all the books normally encountered throughout the game world. It's nice to see them laid out like this, although the same goes for the armor and clothes we saw previously. Besides books, there's one instance of the Elder Scroll normally encountered in the Ultimate Heist here. But that's the only exception, since there are no other quest related books to be found here, and no notes at all. Again, this is probably because these are just here since they were meant to be used as decoration. That's probably also why we have these two flying stacks here in the cell. Oh, and there's another door in this house that doesn't lead anywhere. The next door on our path actually isn't connected to any cell, but we'll encounter some more of those very soon. But before we do, we're moving on to the eastern wall and heading into the activator testing warehouse. A sensible person might expect this cell to contain something to test activators. But as you know, these games aren't made in any sensible manner. Well, of course, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but this cell is kind of pointless. It contains a table, designed for the oak enclosure, designed for the grey mare, a wooden fence gate and an iron fence. Only the latter two are actually related to activators. And yeah, they function fine, but why make a whole cell just for this purpose? We'll be seeing cells in the future that make better use of activators that don't even test those specifically, so I don't know man. Oh and uh, those two signs are both from Coral, just as the interior from the book warehouse. Just another sign of Coral being the first town finished, which I personally find interesting. Oh and if you really want to speculate a bit, it's possible that Bethesda wanted to have these signs to have activators probably exclaiming the title of the establishment. But besides their existence in this cell, there's nothing confirming that. Next up is the container testing warehouse, which is as advertised. Just a test of some containers, not even a majority of them, just a small selection. They're just the basic containers as well, no test variants. The next door will actually bring us to the first cell that isn't a warehouse cell. This cell, called basement test set, is internally known as test basement. It appears to just be a simple mock-up for a basement cell. However, it oddly includes some notes normally only found in dungeons. We have all the notes from Lost Boy Caverns, some having duplicates, as well as the note from Vilverin. Oh, and there are also two instances of the book Test Troll Book. Which is a testing book, alright. Joel likely refers to Joel Burgess, who was credited under additional dungeon art, which may imply that he was also responsible for the creation of this test cell. Next is the Lockpick Warehouse. This is basically like an obstacle course. The whole room is filled with stone walls and wooden fences, the latter being test duplicates. Going from left to right, the locks on set fences become harder and harder to pick, so it's pretty easy to see what's going on here. Although there are two baffling exclusions here in my eyes. First off, there are no lockpicks provided to the player, which, yeah, developers could cheat them in, but that's kind of defeating the purpose of having this test cell in the first place. And the second is the lack of a reward key. Why? 
Well, because the door at the end of the cell is actually linked back to the main testing hall. But it can't be opened because it needs a key. And there is no key actually assigned. Opening the door with console command reveals that it just puts you at the other side of the map, which is very disorienting. But hey, we've long left logic behind on this ride. Next up is another cell that isn't actually a warehouse cell. It's internally known as Test Alchemy Interior, but its name is given as Alchemy Test Warehouse. It's another coral house interior filled with lots of ingredients and all kinds of alchemy equipment. And of course, four different testing chests filled with different kinds of ingredients classified by their origin. General, food, flora and creature. You don't need me to tell you that this cell was used to test alchemy stuff, right? The next door doesn't show the name of the cell you're about to enter. And that's because it doesn't have an in-game name, only an internal name. That name being Test Vampire Interior. This cell really encapsulates the feeling of a well-built test cell. It's another coral house with two beds, two gravestones and a test NPC. Because of the name of the cell, you probably already figured out what the purpose of these objects are. Both gravestones are actually activators that give you vampiric powers with clear instructions on what to do next. The left gravestone gives you the basic vampiric infection and tells you to wait 3 days and then sleep, which is why the double bed is here. After which, your vampiric transformation takes place just like it would in the final game. The right gravestone just skips all these steps and transforms you right away. The test NPC sleeping on the bed is called Vamp Chow, so yeah, the poor soul is just present here to test vampiric feeding on. Alright, that was fun, so how about some disappointment? Well, the next 15 doors don't lead anywhere. The one after that is just blank again. It leads to a cell known as Test Enchanted. This cell is kinda weird actually, in that it doesn't seem to align with its name at first glance. What this cell actually is, is the Quality Assurance Check cell. I say this because the containers this cell contains. The left portion of the room contains 8 crates. They're all prefixed with Test QA, so Test Quality Assurance. And they contain all books, clutter, armor and clothing, ammo and weapons, keys, ingredients and apparatus, potions and soul gems, and sigil stones respectively. The right side of the room holds all armor, books, keys, miscellaneous items, potions and weapons from the Shivering Isles DLC. The only thing that actually ties this cell to its name is this weirdly placed container. It's known as Test Staff, but its internal name is Test Eric. I assume that this chest holds all staffs in the entire game, as it even contains three test variants. The Eric mentioned here is either Eric Dietrich of the programming team or Eric J. Caponi from the additional design team. After this is another unconnected door. And then we have one leading us to the object avoidance warehouse. And this might be the first cell encounter in this video where I don't really know its purpose. As the name implies, I would expect you or an NPC having to avoid objects. But this is just a small walkway featuring tables and test lights. Nothing special happens if you touch the tables either. If it was just meant for you to walk through here, cool, I guess, but I don't really see the point in that. Maybe some test NPC or creature was once present here, but that no longer seems to be the case. I also hope you like the layout of this room, because the next room is basically identical. This is the Pet Grid Testing Warehouse. It's basically exactly the same room as before, but now we have an actual NPC doing the testing, so that the name of the cell makes sense. Our test subject here is named Tulsa Doom, likely named after the character of the same name that appeared in Conan the Barbarian. Since his two AI packages to stroll around here don't actually work, I guess I'll have to give them a boost. Should it not be clear, this time there's only a usable pad made for NPCs between the tables, so they should follow it. If they run into the tables, something is awry. And when I say it like that, I'm even more confused about the last cell, since they're basically identical in layout and purpose. Next up is the NPC Combat AI Warehouse which is actually just an empty cell with some funky lighting. Okay. Not to be confused with the previous cell, we have the AI testing warehouse. This is a dark space inhabited by two test NPCs and a variety of objects such as an easel with a blank canvas, an alembic, some beds, chairs, food and drink. Now one of the test NPCs here we've actually seen in the previous episode, and that's Denier, the super testing merchant. The second one is unique to this cell. His name is Lonely Man, and he's your average AI testing NPC. He just wears some basic clothes and carries a book to read. His unique AI schedule makes him interact with objects in the room, because of course, the whole function of this guy and this cell is to test AI functions like this. And now for something subjective. I suppose this test character was named Lonely Man because he would normally be completely alone in this cell. Then year was added at a later point, and this instance of him was placed way later than his instance in Hawkhaven. 
A developer might have done this in a joking manner in order to make his test NPC feel less lonely, as Denier's presence in this cell doesn't really serve any kind of purpose. The next door leads us to the Hall of Combat, which is another smaller hub of test cells. Oh joy! We're now in a hallway with four doors on either side of us. On the left are three connected doors, and on the right there are two. The first door on the left brings us to the Fighting Dojo, internally known as Warehouse Fight. Once inside, we instantly see an NPC called I Walk Up and Down Stairs, internally known as Test Stair. And while he's present on the stairs, he never actually moves, so that's a big fat zero on his usefulness. The other three test NPCs we're actually already familiar with, as we encountered them in Hawkhaven in the previous episode. We've got another instance of Dewey Decimal, as well as Will Fight Always Never Flee, and Will Flee When Losing. Like Denier, it seems that all three of these guys were first placed in Hawkhaven before they appeared here, as their ref IDs there are numbered a lot earlier than their instances here. And that's it for this cell. The following door on the left reads as blank again, but it leads us to Warehouse NPC buff. This is a very basic cell, similar in layout to the last, but now we actually have three unique test NPCs we haven't encountered yet. They have a similar purpose to the guys from the last cell too, as their name describes the actions they will perform when in combat. On the left is a male high elf called Uses Fortify, and besides the stuff you actually see on him, he also knows the spells Summon Skeleton, Fortify Health, Summon Bound Boots, and Summon Bound War Axe. Of course, the use of the Fortify Health spell is what this guy was made to test, although the NPCs here are quite tanky already without the use of any buffs, at least for my weak level 1 character. The NPC in the middle is a female red guard called Uses Summon. She knows the spells Bound Helmet, Bound Maze, and Fortify Fatigue. She knows no actual summon spells, but I suppose the developers see her bound armor as a spell that summons armor. So, sure. The rightmost NPC is a female dark elf called Uses Bound. She knows the spells Summon Zombie, Bound Sword, and Bound Curus. And seeing as it seems that this NPC was specifically meant to test bound spells, I don't know who messed up with the red guard, but hey, why actually test what you're supposed to test, right? The last door on the left is blank again but it actually takes us to a warehouse test take cover. And let's put this one on the list of places where I don't actually know or understand what's supposed to be tested here. So in the middle of the room, we have the combat ready gentleman called test take cover fighter one and two. Then in the opposing corners of the room, we have two naked battle mages called test take cover caster one and two. Like in the other cells, you're basically just meant to engage in combat with them. So that's what we do. Here's where the first problem comes in. Once you enter combat with someone, the others in the room just kind of ignore it. The two mages are supposed to cast spells, but they never did here. And secondly, I don't really know who's supposed to be taking cover here. Is it the player? Because that really doesn't make a lot of sense. But neither does the NPCs having to take cover, because they don't really do that either. I guess the latter option makes the most sense, but if it doesn't really function as intended, what's the point, right? Moving on to the first door on the right, it leads us to the Combat AI Warehouse. Not to be confused with the AI Testing Warehouse or the NPC Combat AI Warehouse. This is just a very basic room inhabited by three test NPCs, Count Tyrone Rugen, Inigo Montoya and Prince Humperdinck, all three of which are direct references to the 1987 movie The Princess Bride. Now, besides that reference, I don't really know what to tell you about this cell. Maybe this was a very early test for combat AI, as none of the characters present have any notable stats or tactics. They have different levels and equipment, sure, but the only intelligence these guys show when attacking me is actually hitting me. Besides that, there's not much of any engaging combat to be found here. The second door on the right, and the last door of this mini-hub, is blank, but it leads us to the Test Ranged Dungeon. This cell was used to test ranged weapons slash attacks. It's a pretty basic alien dungeon, inhabited by three test NPCs. These test NPCs are known as Test Battle Mage, Test Mage, and Test Hawkeye internally. I'll let you guys figure out their type of attack. Nah, not really. Test Hawkeye is just called Hawkeye, likely referencing a property I don't care about. He's just your stock archer and his equipment is just a random mishmash. Test Battle Mage is called Shows His Arrow Quickly. He's equipped with a sword, a bow and a spell. Test Mage is called Arcana, which is about as stock as a name you could get for a mage, so that fits. He wears a rope, some other stuff and knows three basic spells. He also has a notable base magicka of a thousand, which should help him a bit with spellcasting. So, with a diverse cast of clowns, you still have to punch him manually, as they aren't set up to fight each other, nor you, by default. I guess it's an improvement over the last cell though, as this one is actually kinda fun to battle in. And that brings an end to this mini hub inside of a hub inside of the game. Now we're back into the main testing hall with only one door left. Well, not really. As the last door of this outer door collection is just the exit of the lockpick warehouse, should you remember. However, we're not quite done yet, as the inner square of this room holds two more working doors. 
One leads to Hawkhaven, which we've explored last episode, and the other door brings us to the creature testing hall, which you might also recall from the previous episode. However, now we can see what's inside here. It's basically just another mini hub with only three working doors leading to the Red Grove, Creature Grove and Goblin Grove. All three of which I covered in the previous video, although now you can actually see the mentioned creatures before they get absorbed into the big mess of creatures that's placed in these cells. And that's all the cells covered that are connected to the big testing hall. But there are still a lot of warehouse cells remaining. So why not tackle them as well while we're at it? Well, first I've got to mention the Trespass Test Warehouse and the Crime Warehouse, both of which can be accessed from Hawkhaven, and as such, I've already talked about them in the previous episode, their names should tell you all you need to know about their purpose. Next is another blank cell internally called Warehouse Bar, which is just a storage room for wines and bar objects. They could have just put this in the miscellaneous clutter cell, but oh well. And then there is also Warehouse Magic Armor, simply known as Armor Warehouse in Game, this cell actually has a door that isn't connected to anything, which leads me to believe that this cell was once meant to also be tied to the testing hall. The room is filled with a lot of tables, but only three of them are actually used. One just holds the grey cowl of Nocturnal, while the other two are fully stacked with enchanted variants of Daedric and Chainmail armor respectively. There is also a barrel in the room which is internally known as Test Unique, and it contains all the unique enchanted items that you can get in shops throughout the game. Then there's also another cell called Middle Class Clutter Warehouse, internally known as Warehouse SE Clutter. So with that information, you can already assume that this is just a duplicate of those first clutter rooms, but this time it's filled with clutter from the Shivering Isles DLC. Talking about duplicates of those clutter cells though, here's Grand's Messed Up Upper Warehouse. Yes, that's actually the name of the cell. It's just the upper class clutter warehouse, but this time without any floor or walls, just the objects. The Grant mentioned here is once again Grant Struthers from the World Art team. It's possible that he's also responsible for those clutter cells, but that might be too much of an assumption to make. And that were all the cells. At least the ones that serve a purpose other than being copy paceable rooms for world building, as there are still 27 different cells for that. There are 4 variations of alien ruins, 9 variations for caves, depending on what enemy is meant to inhabit said cave, 1 generic cave stop. 12 different cells for ruined forts, which makes me wonder why they even put in that much effort, one cell for generic mines, and then finally one big warehouse for all the stuff in the Xedillion dungeon for the Shivering Isles. And now we're done with all the warehouse cells. I would say I'm relieved, but next episode is going to feature random separate test cells, and that script is already longer than this one, and I'm not even done yet. So it's gonna be a big undertaking for the final part. I hope this video confused you in the right way, and I hope to see you in the next part of this personal hell I've created for myself called the deep dive in Oblivion's testing content. See you then.